start. So we are discussing a survival screening. So survival screening is done every three years from age 25 to 49. And it is done every five years from age 50 to 64. Two tests are used in the cervical cancer screening. One of them is cytology, either through a pap smear or a liquid based cytology. Both of them are almost the same. Uh, you can say that liquid based cytology is an advanced form of pap smear. So two tests are done in a cervical cancer screening. One is cytology, which is done through pap smear or a liquid-based cytology. And the second test is testing for HPV or human papilloma virus. So in the past, uh, in NHS, in the past, first cytology was done and then HPV testing was done. But now, recently, uh, the guidelines have been changed. Now, primary high risk HPV testing is in the process of coming into the screening program. So now, HR HPV test as, is done as a primary test. In the past, Cytology was done as a primary test. And if there was a suspicion or if there was any cytological changes, then HPV testing was done. But now, recently, HR HPV or high risk HPV, human papilloma virus, high risk human papilloma virus. What are high risk human papilloma virus? High risk are High risk papilloma virus include HPV 16, HPV 18, HPV 31, and HPV 33. They are high risk human papilloma viruses. So now recently, uh, this high risk or HR HPV testing is coming into the screening program. So HPV is used as a primary screening test, which has replaced liquid-based cytology. So what is the pathway or what are the guidelines about uh, these tests? So first of all, HR-HPV test will be done. If HR-HPV HR test is positive, then we'll do cytology. If HR HPV test is negative, then routine recall, which is three years for age 25 to 49 and five years for age above 49. So the first test that will be done is HPV test. If HPV is positive, then we'll do cytology. And on the basis of cytology results, we'll decide about the next step. So if cytology is abnormal, then we'll refer the patient for colposcopy. And if cytology is normal, then we'll rescreen the patient. We'll do the HR HPV test in 12 months. So it's very simple. First of all, HR HPV test will be done. If HR HPV test is negative, then there will be routine recall, three years for people age 25, 49, and five years for age above 49. Now, if the HR HPV test is positive, then we'll send the patient for cytology. Now, on the basis of cytology result, we'll decide about our next step. If cytology is normal, then we'll rescreen the patient in 12 months. And if cytology is abnormal, borderline or worse, then we'll refer the patient for colposcopy.
So the question can either be asked like this, that a patient HRHP test is done and that is positive, but cytology is normal. What is the next step, the step in the management of this patient? Will we screen the patient for HRHP in 12 months? <clears throat> or the question can be asked in the old ways, according to old guidelines, because they are still in practice, uh, because NHS has not fully implemented primary HRHPV. It's just in the process of implementation. So questions according to old guidelines can be asked. Now, according to old guidelines, the cytology testing is done as a primary test. According to latest guidelines, HRHPV test is done as a primary test, while according to old guidelines, cytology test is done as a primary test. So if the cytology is normal, then routine recall. If there are inflammatory changes, then we'll repeat the cytology in six months. If there is mild dyscariosis, If there's mild dyscariosis, then we'll do HPV test. So it's simple. If inflammatory changes on cytology, if normal cytology, then routine recall. If inflammatory changes, then we'll recall the patient in six months. If mild dyscariosis, then we'll do an HPV test. And if HPV test is positive, then we'll send the patient for colposcopy. While in case of moderate or severe dyscariosis or suspected invasion or abnormal granular cells on cytology, we'll refer the patient for colposcopy. We'll do the HPV test only if there is mild dyscariosis. And if HPV test is positive, then we'll refer the patient for colposcopy. In all other cases, such as moderate, severe dyscariosis, suspected invasion, or abnormal glandular cells, will refer the patient for colposcopy. What is dyscariosis? Dyscariosis is basically abnormal cytological changes uh, in the squamous epithelial cells in the cervix, characterized by hyperchromatic nuclei and irregular nuclear chromatin. So a patient with, now just a summary for when you need to refer a patient for colposcopy. If there is mild dyscariosis and HPTS is positive, then you'll send the patient for colposcopy. If moderate or severe dyscariosis, then there's no need to do HPV test. We'll send the patient for colposcopy right away. If suspected invasion, then urgent col colposcopy. For routine colposcopy, such as in this case, or in mild dyscariosis plus HPV test positive, uh, the time for colposcopy is six weeks. While for moderate, severe, and suspected invasion and abnormal glandular cells, the colposcopy should be done urgently. Uh, and urgent colposcopy means a colposcopy within two weeks. What are some other indications for colposcopy? If there are three consecutive inadequate samples of cytology, then we'll refer the patient for a col colposcopy within six weeks. Borderline changes with HR, HP test positive, and low grade changes with HR, HP test positive. Both of them will be sent to colposcopy in six weeks. Moderate, severe, and invasive carcinoma or abnormal glandular cells, they all need a colposcopy within two weeks. 
colposcopy within two weeks of peripheral. So for low grade changes or borderline changes, colposcopy should be done in six weeks. For high grades such as moderate and severe dyskaryosis or suspected invasion or abnormal glandular cells, colposcopy should be done urgently within two weeks. So uh, these are some indications for colposcopy on the basis of cytology, smear result, or on the basis of HRHPV testing. So is it clear everyone up to this point? So other than these indication for colposcopy, can somebody tell me any other indication for colposcopy that we discussed in the previous lecture? Cervical atropion. Excellent, cervical atropion. Cervical atropion, when uh, we'll go for a colposcopy in cervical atropion. Um, is it after after you've done a smear? Uh, a bleeding cervical a cervical ectropion which bleed on touch uh, with a normal cervical smear will send the patient for colposcopy. Mm -hmm. So these were the indication for colposcopy moderate, severe, or glandular cells on cytology, urgent colposcopy, borderline or low-grade changes with HPV-positive test, colposcopy. So remember these uh, indication for colposcopy because one question will be asked in this topic. And this is a diagram of the procedure. Colposcopy in a, which a colposcope is used. A speculum is used to dilate the vagina and to see the cervix closely. And magnifying lens are used to see magnified cells from the cervix because the cancerous cell or precancerous cells, they are hyperchromatic, so they reflect the light. So they appear, they appear white on the colposcope, so that's how we can detect cancerous cells or precancerous cells on colposcopy. High-risk HPV include 16, 18, and 31, and 33, and low-risk HPV is 6 and 11. What are the risk factors? So the most important risk factor for cervical cancer is high risk. The risk factor uh, other than HPV virus include a woman with multiple sexual partners because having multiple sexual partners can increase the chances of obtaining a high-risk HPV. So that's why this is a risk factor. Smoking is also a risk factor for cervical cancer. Immunosuppression can also lead to cervical cancer. And COCP also has a small increase in risk for cervical cancer. So these are some risk factors for cervical cancer. And the presentation of cervical cancer is similar to PAD and uh, cervicitis, such as intermenstrual bleeding, post bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, or vaginal staining, or vaginic discharge, or dyspareunia.
So, a woman present to us, a young female present to us with post cradle bleeding, intermesial bleeding, or vaginal discharge, or deep discharge junior. We will suspect three things pelvic inflammatory disease, and cervicitis, and cervical ectropion, and the other one is uh, cervical carcinoma. Now, a postmenopausal woman present to us with post quadral bleeding, then again, we'll think of three causes of post quadral bleeding or vaginal spotting or vaginal bleeding in postmenopausal women who are above 51. And the most common is atropic vaginitis. The second one is endometrial carcinoma. And the third one is endometrial hyperplasia. So the most common cause of postquartal bleeding in postmenopausal women is atropic vaginitis. So if a scenario is asked in the PLEB1 exam, and they're talking about a woman uh, who is presented to you with post cradle bleeding, and she is menopausal, and they ask you about what is the most likely diagnosis, then your answer should be atropic vaginitis. And if they ask you uh, what is the next best step in the management of this patient, the patient who present to us with postmenopausal bleeding, and they ask you about uh, what is the next best step in the management of this patient, then uh, you will go for a transvaginal ultrasound. Because a postmenopausal woman who present to us with postquartal bleeding, we need to rule out endometrial carcinoma. So that's why the next best step would be to do a transvaginal ultrasound. The transvaginal ultrasound will check the thickness of endometrium. And if the thickness of endometrium is more than 4 mm, then the next step would be to do hysteroscopy and take a biopsy specimen. So a woman with postmenopausal bleeding, the initial step in the management of postmenopausal bleeding is transvaginal ultrasound to rule out endometrial cancer. How we can rule out endometrial cancer with transvaginal ultrasound if the thickness is more than 4 mm, then the suspicion of endometrial cancer will be high and we'll refer the patient for a hysteroscopy and a biopsy. And often biopsy, there are no cancer cells found, then we'll say that it's endometrial hyperplasia. So three causes, atropic vaginitis, endometrial carcinoma, endometrial hyperplasia. So a woman with postmenopausal bleeding, postquartal bleeding in menopause, or after menopause, the most common cause is atropic vaginitis. So they, if they ask you about the most likely diagnosis, then you will choose atropic vaginitis. And the initial step in the management of this patient is to do a transvaginal ultrasound to see the endometrial thickness. If it's less than 4 mm, then endometrial cancer is less likely. And if it's more than 4 mm, then there is chances that it can be endometrial cancer. Then we will do a hysteroscopy and take a biopsy specimen and send it for histopathology to see if there are any cancerous cell found. And if there is no cancerous cell found on biopsy, then we'll label it as endometrial hyperplasia. So a woman with endometrial thickness more than 4 mm on ultrasound, transvaginal ultrasound, and a normal biopsy, We'll label it as endometrial hyperplasia. And if the thickness is more than 4 mm and a normal biopsy, there are atypical cells on biopsy. 
then we'll label it as endometrial carcinoma. Otherwise, it will be a tropicogenitis. So what are the risk factors for endometrial carcinoma? Nulliparity, early menarche, late menopause, obesity, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and tamoxifen. All of them increase the risk for endometrial carcinoma. Nulliparity, because if uh, a female uh, does not get pregnant, then the endometrium will be exposed to estrogen continuously for a longer duration of time and the risk of developing an endometrial cancer can increase easily. If endometrium is exposed to estrogen for a long time, that's why early menarche and late menopause can also lead to endometrial cancer, obesity and PCOs, and also tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is, uh, has a dual action. It acts on the, it blocks the effect of estrogen in the breast tissues. So it is used in the treatment of breast cancer. But tamoxifen can, can cause endometrial cancer because in uterus, tamoxifen acts as an estrogen analog. So it acts in the breast as an estrogen antagonist. And in uterus, it acts as an estrogen analog. So tamoxifen is used in the treatment of breast cancer, but with the use of tamoxifen, the risk of endometrial cancer increases. So for any female who is above 50, 51 years old and present with vaginal bleeding, we'll suspect endometrial carcinoma. The most important diagnosis that we need to rule out is endometrial carcinoma and the most common cause of post menopausal vaginal bleeding is atropic vaginitis. So what causes atropic vaginitis and what are the symptoms of atropic vaginitis? Uh, due to low or no estrogen, the vaginal wall become thin. Or the vagina become atrophied. So that's why it's also called vulvovaginal atrophy, or the other name for this disease is genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So due to low level of estrogen, two things are affected. One is bladder and the other is vagina. Due to vaginal atrophy, the patient will develop dyspareunia, vaginal itching, dryness, burning. And due to affection of the bladder, due to low estrogen, the patient will complain of this urea frequency, incontinence and nocturia. The treatment uh, for atropic vaginitis or vulvovaginal atrophy is tropical estrogen or intravaginal estrogen or estrogen cream. Remember that if the patient is only having symptoms of atrophic vaginitis, then the treatment of choice is topical estrogen and not hormone replacement therapy. Hormone replacement therapy is only indicated if the patient has vasomotor symptoms. What are vasomotor symptoms such as sweating, hot flushes? So if sweating and hot flushes are present, then the treatment will be hormone replacement therapy and not topical estrogen. And only if the signs and symptoms of atropic vaginitis are present, then the treatment will be topical estrogen. So if hot flushes and sweating is present, then the treatment will be hormone replacement therapy. So this was all about the causes of heavy menstrual bleeding or vaginal bleeding in older women who are above 40 years of age, which is 
ectopic vaginitis, endometrial hyperplasia, and endometrial carcinoma. And the steps to rule out endometrial carcinoma is transvaginal ultrasound. And if the thickness is more than 4 mm, then hysteroscopy and biopsy. And if the biopsy is normal, then the diagnosis of endometrial hyperplasia will be made. And the treatment for endometrial hyperplasia is Mirena. A progesterone containing drugs has a protective effect on or it inhibits the growth of endometrium. So that's why Mirena can be used if the patient is diagnosed with endometrial hyperplasia. While the treatment for endometrial carcinoma is hysterectomy. Sometimes uh, during hysteroscopy, the hysteroscope can perforate the uterus and due to uterine or tubal perforation, the patient may present with you abdominal pain, presenting you with abdominal pain, rigidity and hypotension. So patient with a history of hysteroscopy or if a patient develop abdominal pain, rigidity and hypotension after hysteroscopy, then your diagnosis will be uterine perforation. And the uh, next step would be to confirm your diagnosis by doing an ultrasound of abdomen and pelvis to see if there's uterine perforation. So if a woman uh, develops abdominal pain, rigidity, and hypertension after hysteroscopy, then the initial step in the management of this patient is ultrasound of the abdomen. So this was all about endometrial carcinoma, hyperplasia, and atrophic vaginitis. Is it clear, everyone? Is there any question? Okay, now we have uh, discussed uh, CA cervix and CA endometrium. Now it's time to discuss some tumors that are related to ovary. And the first one of them is Meigs syndrome. Meek syndrome is basically a triad of these symptoms. If a stem includes all these features, which is a benign ovarian tumor, pleural effusion, and SID, then the diagnosis of Meek syndrome will be made. So, what will be the features of Meek syndrome? How they are going to ask you about Meek syndrome? A patient with pelvic pain, due to ascites, there will be shifting dullness on examination. And due to pleural effusion, there will be dyspnea, shortness of breath, and decreased breath sounds. And because there is fluid in the pleura, so percussion will be dull. So three symptoms or three features, which is ascites. On examination, due to ascites, there will be shifting downness. Pleural effusion. How, what are the features of pleural effusion? Because there is fluid in the pleura and the lungs cannot expand properly. So the patient will have dyspnea. And on auscultation, there will be a decreased breath sound and on percussion, there will be dullness. And pelvic pain, pain will point towards ovarian tumors. So Meek syndrome is basically a syndrome uh, that is uh, due to a benign ovarian tumor, not ovarian cancer. Now, what will be the features of ovarian cancer? 
So if a woman, uh, especially if 50 or over, so a woman who is 50 or over present to us with heavy menstrual bleed or post quartal bleed or abnormal vaginal bleed, then we'll suspect endometrial carcinoma, endometrial hyperplasia. And if an old woman who is 50 or over present to us with, whenever there's ovarian tumor, the patient will complain of persistent abdominal distension. And because it will be putting pressure on the stomach, so the person will complain of early stity and loss of appetite, pelvic or abdominal pain, increased urinary urgency or frequency. So if a woman who is above 50 years old present to us with these features, then the initial investigation that we will order is CA125, which is a tumor marker for CA ovary. And if CA125 levels are 35 international unit per ml or greater, arrange an ultrasound scan of the abdominal pelvis. So initial step, if you are suspecting an ovarian carcinoma, is CA125 levels. If CA125 levels are raised, raise your levels. In a young woman with suspicion of ovarian cancer, we measure alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG level along with CA25 levels because CA125 levels uh, is a tumor mark for epithelial ovarian cancers, while alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG, they are tumor markers for uh, germ cell ovarian tumors, which are common in young females. So a young female with a suspicion of ovarian cancer, we need to do three tests, beta CD, AFP, and CA125. An old female with a suspicion of ovarian cancer, we only need to do CA125 levels. Uh, sir, sorry, you said uh, young females, beta, HCG, CA125, and what else? Alpha fetoprotein. Okay. They are tumor marker for uh, germ cell tumors such as yolk sac tumor or teratomas, etc. Testicular cancer. Uh, it's common in young males and ovarian cancer or ovarian germinal cancers, they are common in young females. So that's why we need to do these tests as well, along with CA125. If the female is young and there's a suspicion of ovarian cancer. So a summary, short summary of uh, the management of ovarian cancer. That is a woman uh, who is 50 or above who present to us with abdominal blotting, loss of appetite and abdominal pain. CA125 level will be done. CA125 or 35 or above, then we will arrange an urgent ultrasound of the abdominal pelvis. For example, in this scenario, a 65-year-old woman presents complaining of a three-month history of poorly localized abdominal discomfort and blotting. She has lost seven kg over the past two months unintentionally. So a woman with abdominal discomfort and blotting who is above 50. A woman who is above 50 and present to you with abdominal pain and blotting, you will suspect ovarian cancer. The other hint is that she has lost seven kg over the past two months unintentionally. 
she has decreased appetite, she does not have any rectal bleed or abdominal mass or any family history of the cancer. So because she does not have any rectal bleeding, she is an old woman, 65 years old. Colorectal carcinoma are also common in this age group, but there's no rectal bleeding. So the only cancer that we need to rule out is CA ovary because the patient is female and she's above 50 and she's complaining of abdominal bloating and she has lost some weight. What are the risk factors for ovarian cancer? The most important risk factor for ovarian cancer is the family history or a mutation of BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. So BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are also a risk factor for breast cancer and they're also a risk factor for ovarian cancer. Remember this risk factor because this is the important, most important risk factor uh, for causing ovarian carcinoma. Anything that increases the ovulation, uh, because ovaries are involved in the ovulation, so anything that increases the ovulation will increase the risk of ovarian cancer, such as early menarche, late menopause, nulliparity. So these three risk factors are same as for endometrial carcinoma. But in endometrial carcinoma, COCP increases the risk of cervical carcinoma, but they have a protective effect on ovarian cancer because COCP decreases ovulation. So the risk of ovarian cancer decreases if a woman is using COCP. Also pregnancy can decrease ovulation for nine months. There will be no ovulation for nine to 10 months. So pregnancy and COCP, uh, they are both protective for ovarian cancer.